I am ready. So uh, good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, and thank you all for being here this evening. Uh, as chair of the Department of Public Service, I'd like to call this hearing to order. Tonight, we'll be hearing about the next five-year plan for Vision Zero Columbus, the Action Plan 2.0. Vision Zero Columbus is focused on ending crash-related fatalities and serious injuries on our streets while increasing safe and healthy and equitable mobility for all. Uh, we're going to start off with the hearing with a presentation from the Department of Public Service and Transportation. Uh, they're going to go over the plan and give us some details. Uh, we'll ask some questions and then we're going to turn it over for our public commentary. And before I turn it over to public service, um, I just uh, want to reiterate as we think about the growth in Columbus um, and we think about uh, how we move people, uh, this plan is vital and at the core of how we're really thinking about uh, how we are changing and making our streets safer in the city of Columbus for everyone and most certainly our most vulnerable road users, so folks who are on uh, foot or on bicycles and making sure that we're making things more accessible and safe for folks. I shared uh, during our downtown hearings, I myself as a younger person was, when I was working downtown, walking to my car, was actually hit in a crosswalk. Um, and to this day, 20 some years later, I'm still um, dealing with the injuries from that time. And, and just uh, thinking about even the trauma of crossing the street is, is still scary, even years later. And so this is something that for me is very personal as a chair of public service. But as I think about our, you know, my children, my one who's about to drive, uh, both of them who ride their bikes all across the city and that's the way that they get around. My husband, who this was the mode of transportation for him. My mother, who never has driven and still rides code to this, to this day at 83 years old. Um, this is something that is very personal for me and for my family and for the people that I care about. So I want to first thank the Department of uh, Public Service and Transportation. I also want to give um, much credit to Maria Cantrell, who I know she was our Vision Zero coordinator. She has left the department um, and has actually gone on to continue this work on a broader scale. Uh, and I just wanted to, I didn't have the opportunity to publicly thank her at our last council meeting, but I wanted to do it during this hearing because this work is not just vital to Columbus, but also um, I, I see William Murdoch is here from Morphe, and I sit on the policy uh, uh, committee for Morphe, and this is something that we're talking about across the region in Columbus. And so these principles are really going to be a guiding light, not just for us in uh, Columbus, but for uh, around the state and certainly around the region. And I'm proud that Columbus has been leading the way with this work. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to uh, Director Gallagher um, to start us off. Great, well thank you so much council member and very happy to be here this evening to talk about this very important topic um, with everyone tonight. Um, so I'm just going to start with an overview of what is Vision Zero. So Vision Zero is a national movement to end fatal and serious injury crashes. Um, it's different in that it is not focused on property damage crashes. This effort started in Sweden back in the 1990s, and it recognizes that people make mistakes and that we need to design our roadways and our policies so that when this happens and people make these mistakes, the result is not a serious injury or a fatality. Um, and it recognizes also that we all are responsible, that those that are um, designing our roadways, making the policies, enforcing those policies, driving, walking, all of us have a little bit of responsibility um, when we are doing what we do on a daily basis. And I've been in this industry for almost 30 years, and um, I've seen the devastation that this can cause in lives. These are not numbers, even though you, tonight you'll hear us talk a lot about numbers and statistics, but this is not about numbers. 
This is about our husbands, our wives, our sons, our daughters, our mothers, our fathers. And I think that's just so important that that's what we can, that we, that's what we keep in our mind. Um, and our goal is to make sure that those brothers, sisters, husbands, um, wives make it home safely every night. And that's what we need to keep in our minds as we do our jobs every day. Um, but as I said, as we don't talk about numbers, I do want to share a few of those. Um, because this is a chart that shows from 2015 to 2021, and really kind of 2022, um, we've not been going in the right direction. Our numbers have continued to go up here on our Columbus streets. Now, these numbers do not include um, Columbus freeways, um, but even without including those, that you can see our numbers have um, gone up. And in 2022, we lost 22, or I'm sorry, 72 um, very important lives on our roadways. And in 2023, uh, we have already lost 19 lives. That's 19 um, people that, again, didn't make it home um, that night to, to say to their friends and families, hello, I love you, I'm good to see you, et cetera. Um, and we've just, we've got to stop that. These are um, crashes that are preventable. So what this shows is um, that when you are in a, we'll start with the first circle, when you are in a crash that involves a car and you have that crash, there's a 1.5% chance that that crash is going to result in a death or a severe injury. However, as you move across the circle, I'm not going to go over all of these, you can see that that chance of having a severe injury or death increases. So for instance, if you are in um, if you're a pedestrian and you're walking to a Coda bus stop or you're um, a child walking to school or to, you're walking to your doctor's appointment, if you are in a crash, there is a 20% chance that you're going to have a severe injury or there's going to be a death involved. And just think about that. A 20% chance if you're involved in a crash that you, and you're a pedestrian, it's going to result in severe injury or death. That is extremely high percentage. And if you're on a motorcycle, the number is actually 26%. So we just wanted to show here um, that if you're a vulnerable road user, which are the motorcycles, the pedestrians, or the cyclists, what, how high those percentages are. So we, we're showing quite a bit on uh, this graphic here, um, but a few things I specifically want to point out is the fundamental aspect, again, of Vision Zero is eliminating those worst crashes, those fatal crashes and those serious injury crashes. Another fundamental aspect of the Vision Zero approach is the use of data to inform our decision making and target our inter interventions effectively. By analyzing this information about crash locations, our behavior of our road user, and demographics, we can gain valuable insights into the factors contributing to these severe crashes. This data-driven approach helps identify the high-risk areas and prioritize interv interventions where they are most needed. So this concept of the high injury network is a, cri a critical component of Vision Zero. And you can see on this map, those high injury networks are the roads that are shown in red. These are the streets, the intersections, the corridors where a disproportionate number of our severe crashes and deaths are occurring. By identifying these high risk locations, we can focus our efforts and resources um, to target our efforts to make when we make our safety um, improvements. I do want to point out that 65% um, of our fatal, our serious injury crashes, and our vulnerable road user crashes occur on 10% of Columbus roadways. So just think about that number for a minute. 65% 
of fatal serious injury and vulnerable road user crashes occur on only 10% of our Columbus streets. And again, that's what you're seeing here in the red. Um, so during our Vision Zero Action Plan 1.0, um, which Bernardo is gonna talk a little bit more about the specifics of some of the things we did in that, um, we focused the majority of our safety improvements along these high injury network streets. Um, so 71% of our total intersection improvements occurred on those red streets. 67% of our total crosswalk markings um, upgrades were on those streets and 100% of our total corridor improvements were on those streets. And then Vision Zero also recognizes a disproportionate impact of our traffic related injuries were in our vulnerable communities or our communities of interest, such as our under, un, underserved um, neighborhoods and our marginalized populations. And these are the areas that you can see on the map shown in blue. By addressing our traffic safety issues, Columbus can work towards achieving the equity and improving the overall health and well being of our residents. Because you can really see here how much the blue and how much the red overlap one another. It's quite an amazing statistic that we were able to see there once we started overlapping our data. So, one of the key emphases um, of Vision Zero is reducing speeds. By implementing measures such as traffic calming techniques and road narrowing, Vision Zero seeks to lower vehicle speeds to a level where crashes, when they do happen, are less likely to result in fatalities or severe harm. This deliberate effort to reduce speeds helps to create a safer environment for all road users, including pedestrians, cyclists, and motorists. Street design plays a pivotal role in our Vision Zero framework. The design of roadways and intersections can greatly influence the safety of those who use them. Vision Zero advocates for street designs that prioritize safety with features like separated bike lanes, sidewalks, pedestrian refuse islands, and dedicated crosswalks. These design elements promote better visibility, they improve accessibility, and enhance overall safety. By adopting street designs that accommodate the needs of all road users and prioritizing their safety, Vision Zero strives to create a more inclusive and pedestrian-friendly urban environment. And to go into more detail, I am now going to turn the presentation over to Ronaldo. Thank you, Director. And so first, I'll start off by touching on some of the accomplishments from our first Vision Zero action plan. Our first Vision Zero Action Plan was launched in March of 2021, and it ended in March of 2023. So that action plan was a two-year action plan that was implemented during the height of COVID, which came with a lot of challenges. But we were able to achieve a lot of successes through that plan. Some of the things included increasing the awareness of Vision Zero and what it entails through communications, through various communities, our partners, and just really trying to get the message out and the word out. Um, overall, we accomplished 95% of our strategies satisfactorily, and um, several of the strategies, we actually exceeded the goals that we set for. So, for example, the numbers of crosswalks, we were aiming to install at least 30 each of those years. We were able to um, install significantly more than that. Same thing with improving the number of, uh, improving various traffic signals throughout the city for safety reasons. One of the key accomplishments from this action plan was the implementation of our downtown speed limit. So in downtown Columbus, we earlier this year, as you mentioned, council member, implemented the 25 mile an hour speed limit in our downtown, which includes multiple high injury network streets. It's an area where we have a lot of pedestrian activity, a lot of bicycle activity. Um, along with that, we installed 115 signs to make that happen. And there's a 134 traffic signals that we retimed such that it's designed so if you're driving 25 miles an hour, you're more likely to be able to progress along the corridors as you should. Um, if you're speeding, you're more likely to be stopped at a red light. So just trying to increase safety with some of those improvements. One example um, of a corridor improvement that was developed during that action plan is our Sullivan Avenue corridor. 
It's a 1.7 mile long corridor where we were seeing a lot of high speeds and a higher number of pedestrian crashes. So what you see on the left is the before um, image of how it looked prior to implementing some of our um, some of our countermeasures. And afterwards, some of the things that we did was we added additional crosswalks throughout the corridor. We improved crosswalks by building curb extensions to make the roadway feel more narrow. So if you're a pedestrian crossing the street, you have a shorter distance to cross. And as a motorist driving down the street, it encourages slower driving. It encourages following the posted speed limit. So implementing that all throughout the corridor, since we've put everything into place, we've seen a 50% decrease in the number of crashes along the corridor. So that's you know one of our earlier successes, just trying to encourage safer behavior from uh, both uh, motorists and just everyone using the roadway. Another example on Livingston Avenue, this is a corridor that in the photo on the left, um, it was a four lane roadway, two lanes in each direction. We were seeing a lot of, uh, lot of speeding along that roadway, a lot of incidents to where crashes would force vehicles to run off the road and run into people's homes. That's a very dangerous situation for the homeowners, the motorists, pedestrians, and bicyclists that may be using the roadway. So we worked together with the community and our neighbors and our partners um, in the city of Bexley to really hone in and study uh, this section of Livingston Avenue east of I-70. And on the right is the result of that study. So between the streets of uh, College Avenue and James, we implemented what we commonly reference as a road diet. And we changed the roadway configuration from four lanes to three that added a center turn lane to provide for safe turning movements. We added crosswalks. In the photo, you see an example of a median island just, again, to make the roadway feel more narrow and encourage people to drive at the posted speed limit. And some of the early successes that we've seen is a significant reduction in the amount of people that are speeding excessively along Livingston. In the early months of implementation, we were seeing 90% um, fewer people that were driving at greater than 50 miles an hour along that corridor. So um, the residents are reporting back that it's working. And again, we're working with the city of Bexley to um, take some of those improvements even further moving forward. I mentioned earlier that we exceeded our crosswalk goals in the first action plan. We were able to install more than 150 uh, crosswalks. That includes new crosswalks or improved or upgraded crosswalks. So um, it may be an area, um, maybe it's along a school route where a lot of kids are walking. It's a lot of on our high injury network streets, just a variety of improvements throughout the city. And that's certainly something we're gonna look to continue to improve upon. Now I'm gonna talk about our new action plan. Um, this is a five-year action plan where we're looking to build off some of the things that we implemented with the first action plan, some of those foundational activities to really continue to move us closer to our goal. Grouping the strategies, they kind of fit in four different buckets. One of them is using data to drive our safety improvements. One is No, no problem. <laughs> Affecting change by improving safety practices. One is transforming the built environment. And the other is pursuing culture change to support traffic safety for all. Now I'm gonna step through each of these categories. I'm not going to read through each individual one, but I'll highlight some on each slide. Um, on this slide, I'd like to highlight the fact that we'd like to establish an annual citywide uh, top 25 priority improvements list. So going back to what Director Gallagher mentioned about using data to really um, drive where we're focusing our efforts, this is going to help us look in and see where are the crashes happening, what are the patterns, where do we need to focus our attention on, what needs to be studied, improved, um, things of that nature. So it's really going to be our guiding light um, as a department on where we're focusing, on where we're trying to make some of these changes. On this one, I will highlight the fact that um, we're going to look at establishing a roundabouts policy. So roundabouts are a treatment that are used. Um, we have several of them in our city, and our neighboring jurisdictions have them as well. It's a means of traffic control that, while there's a wide range of opinions for motorists that use them, the data shows that 
you have significantly less of a chance of getting into a serious injury or fatal crash while um, driving through them. They've been proven to slow speeds as people navigate through the intersection, and they are um, actually quite efficient, not only for motorists, but also bicyclists and uh, pedestrians um, navigating through the intersection as well. And the two other items I'll highlight are the uh, leading pedestrian interval and flashing yellow arrow. So these are two examples of traffic signal technology that have been shown to, um, in the case of the leading pedestrian interval, uh, reduce the amount of pedestrian crashes by giving the pedestrian a head start. We've implemented uh, seven of these so far in our downtown area, including at Mountain High near the courthouse, and we'll look to continue to implement more of those. And then the flashing yellow arrow, that's been proven to reduce the number of serious crashes for people making left turns. So those severe angle or T-bone crashes, um, that's a proven countermeasure at attacking those. On this slide, we're working with several of our partners, both internal to the city and external to the city, um, to pursue other changes to improve safety. So there's one uh, working with our partners in the Division of Fire, as well as our partners in uh, the Division of Police, um, looking at ways that, again, just reducing the likelihood of a crash and um, ensuring compliance with uh, posted speed limits and other driving behaviors. Um, we're also going to work with our partners at um, the state and the Ohio Department of Transportation to take a look at their policy on setting speed limits. So the way we set speed limits is governed by state law and the Ohio Department of Transportation provides guidance on how to do that. They have heard um, the desire to look at how those are set in urban areas. Um, there are different things that we need to take into account versus you know, most of the state of Ohio, which may be more rural in nature, um, but we have a lot of things like on-street parking, different development patterns, and things that need to be taken into account to make sure that we're setting the appropriate speed limits on our roadways, and they're working with us to do that. On this slide, I will highlight that we are working with our partners at CODA um, to pursue technology improvements to increase transit safety, as well as our partners at MORPSI. Um, and with MORPSI, just looking into how can we incorporate more of these actions into different policies, procedures, programs, um, just working closer together as a region to push this uh, goal forward of trying to get to uh, zero serious crashes and fatalities. On this slide, I will highlight the fact that similar to what I mentioned on the Livingston Avenue slide, we are going to look to initiate um, the construction phase of uh, other lane reconfiguration efforts, looking for other opportunities to where just over years, driving patterns change, traffic volumes change, developments change. Some of our roadways that you know seem like really, ro really wide roadways now, we don't still need them to be that wide. We don't need seven travel lanes on some roadways. So where can we take a closer look, work with the community, really dive in and see how can we repurpose this, these particular roadways to work better for all roadway users to where we're still servicing, serving the vehicular need, but then also taking um, into account the needs of pedestrians and bicyclists to get around the city in a more network fashion. On this slide, I will highlight that we are looking to, um, over the life of the plan, install a minimum of 25 miles of sidewalk and shared use paths throughout the city as well as creating 25 miles of separator or protected bike facilities. Um, I'll build on the bike facility um, one in a, in a couple of slides, but those are um, two things that, again, trying to serve those vulnerable road users that have the higher chances of um, being seriously injured or killed in a crash, separating them from the vehicle string and giving them more protection when navigating throughout the city. On this slide, we're looking to implement five quick build safety projects um, aimed at reducing crashes. So this example is on Mount Vernon Avenue, and the photo is specifically at Mount Vernon and Champion. Mount Vernon Avenue is posted at 25 miles an hour. It's the section that's east of 71 and uh, west of Champion, but it's an area where we heard a lot from the community that there were a lot of concerns with excessive speeding and a high number of crashes at some of the intersections. So again, working with the community, we dove in, looked at the data, listened to their concerns, and we were able to take what was a two-lane roadway with two very wide lanes. Um, there was a parking lane that wasn't very u heavily utilized. Um, we were able to go in with our in-house forces, um, install pavement markings and reboundable posts to, again, make that roadway feel more narrow, shorten the crossing for pedestrians. In this picture, we were able to convert Mount Vernon and Champion, as well as Mount Vernon in Ohio, to all-way stops. And since we've implemented those changes, we've seen 85% percent 
fewer crashes throughout the entire corridor. So before the project started, we had 27 crashes throughout the corridor. And since uh, in the one year after we put that uh, improvement in, uh, we only saw four crashes. So, you know, that was a big success. And um, again, encouraging uh, slower uh, traffic moving throughout the corridor. And we want to replicate that success on more projects throughout the city. There are situations where we may identify a long-term fix, but these are tools that enable us to be able to address it now until the long-term fix gets there. And we're going to continue to identify opportunities to do that. On this slide, I'll start with, uh, we're looking to adopt and implement a new citywide bikeways and micromobility plan. So our current bikeway plan was created in 2008, and a lot of things have changed in the past 15 years. There's a lot of development changes, a lot of growth throughout the city of Columbus. Things that were assumed back then have changed, and just the state of the industry and practice have changed. So we're kicking off that effort now. Um, there's going to be a lot of public outreach throughout um, that process. For anyone that wants to hear more about that, they can visit our website at columbus.gov slash bikeways. Um, we're going to put out a survey in the coming weeks to try to um, get more public input information um, to help guide us throughout that plan. But it's going to set the guidelines for when we're moving forward on future projects, when we're moving forward working with developers, how we should be designing our roads to get the bike infrastructure that we want to achieve. So that 25 mile an hour of 25 separated or protected bike facilities that I mentioned a couple slides ago, this is going to be the plan that guides us in that direction, identifies some quick build opportunities to get in quickly, um, and then also which projects we can get into design so that we can increase the amount of facilities throughout uh, Columbus. And along with that, we will develop an uh, infrastructure maintenance plan because it's one thing to construct the facility, but it's critically important that we maintain it in a manner that's safe for everyone using it as well. Finally, on this slide, um, we're going to continue our multilingual outreach and education campaign. Here at the right in front of us, we have several examples of some posters um, that we've created in multiple languages. Columbus is a very diverse city in a lot of ways, and language is one of them. So we need to make sure that we're reaching everyone with our messaging. That's something that you know we got feedback early on in the process that we really needed to hone in and do. Um, and then working with, again, our external partners at Columbus City Schools to establish a city uh, school district-wide speed reduction campaign. Um, and then continuing work that was built upon in the first action plan on the annual school traffic safety awareness week. So that concludes the uh, presentation portion. Again, for anyone that's wanting more information or a copy of the action plan, please uh, feel free to email us at vision zero at columbus.gov or visit our website at www.columbus.gov slash vision zero. Thank you. Uh, so thank you, Director Gallagher, and thank you. We did not properly introduce um, Administrator uh, Ronaldo Stargell, who is uh, head of traffic management at the Department of Public Service. I just have a couple questions, um, especially now as we're talking capital campaign or, or capital budget and folks are asking lots of questions. I mean, I think I, I often joke around that. I feel like I'm the bell of the ball between um, chairing public service and neighborhoods, uh, which is our area commissions and uh, public service is always at the top of the list of things that folks care about when they, you know, roadways, sidewalks, et cetera. Um, can you all talk just a little bit about the, especially for residents to understand so we have Vision Zero, and that's kind of like the plan or the framework for our thinking about how we are um, improving roadways and constructing new paths, right, with development that is coming. How do we balance that when we make decisions around um, neighborhood safe, neighborhood uh, traffic improvements, right? I, I We'd be hard pressed to find any part of Columbus, I mean, and at this point we've been like almost in all four corners where folks have said, I live here, I live here, there's traffic concerns, there's other challenges that they're experiencing. Can y'all just talk a little bit about what folks can expect, especially when we talk about high injury network, because we're giving people different lists of priorities, and I can see, I, I can feel residents thinking, well, where do we lie in that priority list, and how do folks make decisions about our neighborhoods and our streets? Um, yes, yeah, so I'll give a, a little high level and then you can fill in some details. Um, so when we are prioritizing projects, 
Um, the first thing I would say for residents is please give us um, feedback through 311. And I know that sounds like probably the answer you get all the time, but we really use 311 for feedback. Um, not only do we try to get in there and give good feedback back to residents consistently on like where we are with that request, um, and it may seem like it's taking a while to get a project done or to get feedback, but we try to compile that information, especially if it's we want a sidewalk here, or we want a road diet here. Um, we use that information when we are determining what projects to do. And um, then as we're, as we're making our determination, we also use, like I said, data. Um, we have a phenomenal asset management program and so we're using data on you know the condition of things where the crashes are occurring volumes of roadway um, pedestrian information bicycle information where schools are where coda stops are um, where the hospitals are i mean there's a lot of data that goes into this um, but i will say information from our constituents is also very important. Data can only take you so far, but then that real life experience also really helps us. Um, we are happy to come out to meetings, um, especially area commission meetings, civic association meetings, and hear from residents on things that maybe we just can't see or tell from data um, because we as engineers can only see so much um, but if but if multiple people are telling us the same thing that is is very helpful and the kind of piggyback on the concern about the you know the high injury network and you know what that entails while that is a guiding light as far as you know where the most crashes are happening and where we are going to look to try to correct some of those we're not by any means um, not going to continue to do projects and you know our neighborhood so again using 311 um, you know when we're rolling out the bike plan that's going to have a pretty heavy public involvement portion we want to hear from the community we want to hear how different people are commuting back and forth to work if they're using a bike if they're walking um, if they you know it'd be really great if we had a sidewalk to help get my kids to school get to my appointments connect me to a bus route connect my children um, to school bus pick up and drop off all of those details are really helpful to us because again, to Director Gallagher's point, we can only see so much through the data, but getting that perspective through the eyes of people that are using our network every day is really critical for us to delivering a great end product. Um, and then, and I believe that some of this data is also accessible on our website, correct? For the public to see? The what? The, some of the data that you're sharing is accessible on the website, correct? So folks can actually see some of the maps that you showed. So if they wanted to know, because I, I think often, you know, it's a perspective. I mean, uh, first of all, I drive down Livingston almost every day. So it, yeah, I feel that road improvement. I live two minutes away from James Road, which I know is a pain point. We just legislated some um, improvements along James Road. But I think, you know, when you live towards the, uh, when you live in the vicinity of major corridors like that, it feels, you inherently feel that differently than, you know, other folks. So being able to know what does this look like, am I, uh, is this street that is of a concern for me, it's just another data point, but folks can know that it's on there, that potentially it's on the docket for us to work on, and then using 311 is another mechanism to advocate for some of those changes to perhaps come a little quicker. We've also been working with the department um, to, uh, we've legislated some funds for tactical urbanism. So that champion example, my uh, chair, uh, council member Favor, when she was chair, put this into practice, was a good practice. We continued that on to look at how can we get some roadway improvements. I believe we're doing one on Lockbourne um, that's coming up. So, um, so there's some things that we can move on a little bit more quickly with the advocacy of neighbors. I just wanna make sure that folks see that, that they don't don't think that it's either or yes. that's like everything is vision yes. zero we get if we don't fall in line with that then we're not gonna get something right so I just wanted that to be clear to our residents yes. um, I'm gonna I, um, 
I believe in keeping it real with our folks. Uh, these improvements are safety improvements. <laughs> Ronald, or uh, Administrator Stargell, I'm looking at you when I say this. This does not mean that it's going to stop or make traffic more efficient in all places, correct? That's correct, yes. And I want to say, I want to state that because I think that when we think about our, another major strategy that we have coming up is Link Us, which is a, a bus rapid transit, which is an opportunity to get more people moving more quickly and less vehicles, which would actually make traffic more efficient. Absolutely. Go yeah, ahead. by. Um by introducing things like link us and giving people alternatives to driving in a car to get to where they need to go, uh, you know, whether it's using um, upgraded bus routes, whether it's using um, high capacity transit, more bikeways, more pedestrian walkways, getting people to feel comfortable using other modes safely throughout our city inherently reduces the amount of traffic or amount of cars driving on our roadways and it just makes it safer for everyone. The other thing that it does is it has an impact on the types of places and the locations where people want to live as well. So, you know, as people are, you know, moving closer to, you know, the, the core of Columbus um, and using transit and everything, that's that's a net benefit for uh, roadway safety and just people trying to get around in general. And I appreciate that because I just, I, I also, one thing that we hear a lot of is just traffic congestion. And so I think part of just having a higher density city, that is a reality. And the more options of modes of transportation that we give people, especially when safety is on top of those modes, then it just means that everybody moves more efficiently. Absolutely. And we move people more effectively, right? So I just wanted to make that clear for folks. So uh, the other, we've talked a lot, and I know I feel like I get an education every time, um, you know, we meet with a uh, public service, but as we talk about some of the strategies, you know, giving folks, um, uh, the pedestrian, oh, I just like lost it. Tell me what it's called again. The leading pedestrian interval. Thank you, leading <laughs> pedestrian intervals. Um, so this is a crosswalk that actually helps pedestrians get across. It gives them essentially more time to get across, gives them the right of way before someone can make a turn. When we say all of these terms, and again, if I'm doing this all the time, it's hard for me to, uh, it took me like, now two years in to get tactical or urbanism correct, but um, how are we educating the public? How are we reaching out? How are we letting them know about some of these strategies? Can we talk about what that plan is a little bit? So as far as generally through Vision Zero, we had a lot of outreach and activity um, in, as part of the first action plan and Vision Zero in general. So with that action plan, we had over 2,600 uh, touch points to where we were going to community festivals, um, different parades, just different events throughout the city to try to reach a wide variety of people just to get the word out there. But even beyond that, for various projects, we've had a lot of outreach efforts as well. Um, along Cleveland Avenue, where we're looking to install uh, seven crossings uh, along that corridor, there's been a separate uh, outreach campaign associated with that where we've worked with the community to again, try to get the word out, not only about the project itself, but just railway safety in general. So that's an effort that we have with a lot of our construction projects. If we're putting in something that's new, different, changing patterns, we try to um, work with the community, get the word out to the community so that whenever what we're constructing opens, um, you know, everyone will be familiar with it and know how to use it, drive it, walk it, et cetera. And I will say also, um, one of the things that I thought was really interesting is if anybody knows Dom Tiberi, um, and unfortunately he lost his daughter to a horrific traffic um, incident, and so we worked closely with him and Maria's message um, to continue to engage with high school students because that's really the age where you're starting to drive, you're behind the wheel of vehicle um, and taking control. So we've worked with him um, and we'll hopefully be able to continue to do that. Um, one of the things we're going to start doing a lot more of is these posters and just really trying to do just some quick hit messages. Um, this is our first run of them, but I think with Vision Zero 2.0, get out to places where people are just going in, whether it's 
going into the BMV, whether it's going into the hospital, whether it's going into your pharmacy, whether it's going into the bank, whether it's going into the child care center, that just say, arrive home safely, mm. or um, get your kid home safely, or um, don't drive and text, or just quick message, just as little reminders. You know that sometimes we just get in our day-to-day -day routine and kind of for forget. Um, so we're gonna do a lot more of those things in this coming Vision Zero plan. We've also engaged um, and trained Vision Zero ambassadors. Mm. So it's not just public service or City of Columbus employees, but it's people that live in your neighborhoods, people that you know that are out um, talking about this message. Um, because it, people know, I mean, people know you shouldn't speed. People mm. know you shouldn't be eating and doing your makeup and reading a book all while at the same time while you're trying to drive. However, people still do. Um, and so it's just the reminders and a reminder before something bad happens in your life that you're like, oh, now I know to not do these things. Mm -hmm. um, so again, trying to engage with the public um, in just little quick snippet ways, because it's just a reminder. Sure. And you you mentioned this just a little bit, but just to put a finer point on it, especially as we think about our area commissions or other neighborhood groups, civic associations that may be very interested in getting involved or engaged, or just we have um, advocates that, you know, whether it's folks from the cycling community or even folks who have been advocating after they've lost a loved one due to a uh, traffic fatality. How do folks get involved? I know we've had some efforts like Walk Safe Dawn Cleveland where you talked about the ambassador program and we've had some other campaigns in neighborhoods, but if, if there's a particular resident or a group that really wants to get engaged and involved with Vision Zero, how do they do that? Yep, so um, the community can go to our website and learn more about Vision Zero. There's also a way on the website where they can take a pledge to help us reduce the serious um, injury and fatal crashes. Um, there's an interactive map there where they can mark locations that they feel are um, a location that we should be aware of. Um, but then also, if, if you're involved in a, in a medium-sized, large group and you want us to come out and talk, to that group, we are, well, we'll be more than happy to do that once we have a new Vision Zero coordinator. <laughs> um, but we are more than happy to come out and talk to organizations, um, talk to high school kids, talk to adults, talk to whomever, um, and, and kind of go over some of the, the data um, and, and show them that they can make a difference, that everybody can make a difference. Perfect. Happy, happy to do that. Thank you so much, and thank you for the presentation. Uh, we're gonna switch now to uh, talking to some of our community partners that are here, um, hearing from them, and then public testimony as well. Uh, you know, as I, as we hear from our partners, um, I always think of things in threes, and I think um, if we think about Vision Zero, these are not part of the Vision Zero talking points just so everyone knows. This is Council Member Barroso de Padilla's talking points. But as I think about this, there's, there's three pieces to this, right? So there's changing the environment, so actually creating environments that, you know, whether we're using bump outs or road diets or whatever, it's putting these tools on the road so that we're changing behaviors, right? We're creating the structure so that people can be safer. Secondly, it's that education piece. So people actually using the tools of the road because we can, I mean, we, we have red lights and people still run them, right? Like you have to pay attention or that's when a crash happens. That's when something, unfortunately, we can find ourselves hurting someone or hurting ourselves. And so it's that education piece. And then the third piece is about enforcement, right? So it's really ensuring that folks understand that there is, we're changing the environment, you're using the tool, and if you don't, there is some sort of action that will be taken because I think that's the other piece of feedback that we've certainly heard is that if we're, we're doing all of this, we're making these changes, you know, folks are then like, well, if there is no consequence to it, folks aren't gonna do it, right? Which is, you know, we're all, we're all inspired to change by different things. So, um, so those three pieces I think are reflective of our community partners that are here today to talk a little bit about how we're using education, how we're enforcing these pieces, how we're thinking about that regional infrastructure change, um, 
and then also how we're educating uh, the community. So with that, I'd like to first invite up uh, Ebony Johnson from Columbus City Schools to talk a little bit about our um, education piece in uh, CCS. Thank you for being here tonight. And then up next, we will have uh, Special Services Deputy Chief Robert Sagel. Did I say that correctly? Yeah. Great, thank you. The floor is yours. Good evening. Is this on? Good evening. You're good. Good, okay, okay, perfect. Um, thank you, Public Service and Transportation Chair Councilwoman um, Barossa de Padilla for providing this opportunity to share how Columbus City Schools is working with Vision Zero to champion the message of drive safe, walk safe, and bike safe for our students. My name is Ebony Johnson. I'm Elementary Curriculum Programming Supervisor with the Office of Teaching and Learning for Columbus City Schools. Through our collaboration with Vision Zero program administrators, we were able to design comprehensive traffic safety awareness learning experiences for our K through 12 students. Our focus was to educate our students on how they can bike, walk, and drive safely, along with being safe passengers. For example, we established a Traffic Safety Awareness Week to provide hands-on experiences for students to truly immerse themselves in the lessons of traffic safety. A few examples include elementary students creating paper chains with safe messages to display throughout their school, middle school students calculating the effects of speed and momentum on breaking and stopping distances, and high school students designing innovative, reflective products to enhance visibility while walking and biking. The response was amazing. Our students, staff, and families were able to see the importance of the Vision Zero initiative. They also learned practical strategies to reduce traffic-related incidents. During a recent survey, parents highlighted speeding in residential neighborhoods as the most prevalent safety concern for children who walk or bike to school. As we move into our 23-24 school year and beyond, we are excited to continue our partnership with the City of Columbus by making specific commitments in the 2023-2028 through 2028 Vision Zero Action Plan. They are we have committed to developing a district-wide school zone speed reduction campaign to encourage and enforce safe driver behaviors in our neighborhoods. We have committed to enhancing learning experiences for students to build pedestrian safety awareness. And we have committed to expanding the number of schools implementing Vision Zero initiatives and activities during Traffic Safety Awareness Week to reinforce safety into the building culture. In closing, Columbus City Schools is excited to continue this partnership and look forward to seeing the positive impact our strategies will have on developing safer walkers, bikers, drivers, and riders in the city. Thank you for your continued efforts to support the children of Columbus and prioritizing student safety. Thank you so much. Uh, before you go, I, there are just a couple of questions. Um, also, I know that Maria's message was also part of this as we think about, I mean, I think um, uh, one thing that we've heard a lot about is our younger drivers on the road and going at higher speeds or texting while driving, that sort of thing. Can you just talk about a little bit about the awareness campaign as it pertains to our younger drivers? And is this correct that, do we still offer driver's ed? No. Um, no, not. Yeah, I didn't think so. I, I just wanted to confirm because I said that yesterday and then I was like, I, I need to confirm that I'm correct about that. But So yes, we did participate in Maria's message. Um, Don came out to Independence High School last year during our Traffic Safety Awareness Week. And we are planning to continue that initiative for next year as well. Great, thank you. And then for our um, younger, especially when I think about the kids who are walking to school and just ensuring that they're not 
darting out in the street or when they're playing with their friend. I mean, I say this because I was a walker. So, um, uh, you know, how they're thinking about being safe as they're walking to school. What is some of the, you mentioned this a little bit, but can you talk a little bit about the response and, you know, some of the feedback that you've heard maybe from community residents or from parents, that sort of thing from this, uh, the campaign? So absolutely. So some of the activities that we had, what we did was we designed learning experiences for our elementary, middle, and high schools. And so elementary was really focused on that, being non-distracted walkers or <laughs> bikers or even while you're riding within the car. And so some of those activities included activities for the teachers to work with their students, so direct um, learning curriculum type activities. But we also did like morning announcement campaigns. We also had a video for the students to watch. And so um, we had little, um, we did uh, bracelets as reminders, bright orange bracelets mm -hmm. for students to even see uh, a visual of being a Vision Zero hero. And so I think that helped um, just to recall the information that we were going through during that week for our students. So I have a 13 year old niece in our district and even she would hear the Vision Zero commercials and she's like, we talked about that at school. Mm -hmm. This is what we did. And so I think all of that awareness and, and our partnership is helping so that our students, as as they're talking with their families and other people and within the school, they can recall some of those strategies that we're working with them on. No, that's great. And I think uh, we just talked about this last night. Um, we were at the uh, uh, northeast, we're in the Brittendale neighborhood talking about um, this same issue and just thinking about how we are also instilling this in our young people now. Mm -hmm. So it's harder to change minds and hearts the older that we get. But if we start making this a common practice for our young people, how are we changing the game? Especially because they just have much more to contend with than we did mm -hmm. when we were younger. So, um, so thank you so much for your work and thank you for being here this thank evening. Thank you. Great. Deputy Chief. And after Deputy Chief, we have a CEO, Deputy CEO Monica Tellis Fowler. Thank you for inviting uh, me tonight, Council Member. I appreciate it. Um, obviously, I'll, I'll start with one thing that the Columbus Division of Police is always dedicated to uh, doing any kind of education or enforcement that's going to lessen. Uh, either just regular traffic crashes mm -hmm. or traffic crashes that are gonna to lead to severe injury or death. But speaking specifically about Vision Zero and its importance is it, you kind of pointed out the three parts of it. You know, public service is going to design safer, or safer roadways. We're then gonna educate the community and then we have to have a follow-up enforcement as well mm -hmm. so that we can um, use that both as an education piece and an enforcement piece. Uh, in the city of Columbus, we don't just change a law and then go directly into enforcement. We do heavy education, and that includes education through law enforcement. Mm -hmm. So usually we set a time span where we're going to uh, issue warnings based upon a new law or you know a new traffic pattern or things mm -hmm. like that, just so that people that violate the law are then just made aware of it rather than having to just be fined right away. Mm -hmm. And then they can learn from that. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully we start creating a culture of compliance with the new, uh, the new initiative or roadway. Mm -hmm. So Vision Zero is very important because it uses a lot of data as well. And that's gonna allow the Division of Police to work with public service to utilize that data. And we will meet regularly to then do basically targeted enforcement in the areas that are either lacking on the compliance uh, or maybe that we're not um, there yet with the design and implementation mm -hmm. parts of it. Just trying to think outside the box of ways that we can reduce these severe crashes earlier uh, before we're waiting on major long-term um, investments, projects, things like that that take quite some time. So during a five-year plan, you know, there's, there's no stopping us from starting to reduce these through enforcement, mm -hmm. education, different kinds of activities. So what we're committing to is, is obviously the entire Vision Zero plan, but specifically uh, what we're committing to is to meet with uh, public service on a quarterly basis. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at all the data that in these, these high injury locations, and we're gonna create then monthly traffic enforcement plans that we can put into action. That's gonna then allow us to start lessening the impact of whatever it is that's creating those uh, hazards in those locations so that we can hopefully lessen that. 
and then of course working with public service, then they're going to be able to examine the entire overall picture of what it looks like to longer term fix those, fix those plans. And then of course as they're working through the different projects, we'll be able to see what they just implemented, how we can then go in there and educate and then enforce beyond there. And the other thing we're going to do is we're going to implement training for all of the police officers on the new distracted driving laws. Mm. Uh, that's going to happen within this year, 2023. Uh, that way, every officer is trained on the ins and outs. It's, it's actually a very complicated law. Uh, so when you break it down, it's going to take a lot of, you know, just let's simplify this down so officers know what they can and can't enforce, um, you know, how to enforce it properly because we obviously know that the dangers of distracted driving. We've spoken a lot about Maria's message and things like that. Uh, distracted driving is you know, one of our uh, highest priority things. And um, there's important laws that have been put into place, but they are complicated laws. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna do division-wide training so that every officer fully understands the, the laws that are on the books and how to enforce them properly. Um, beyond that, again, we're just looking forward to being partners in this entire initiative, just like we were in phase one. Uh, phase two, uh, it's an exciting plan over the next five years. So thank you for being here, and thank you for um, also illustrating the point of giving folks grace as we change things, right? So, you know, downtown, I'm thinking, is, is a perfect example of it's a 10-mile reduction in speed. Everyone may not have been aware. Maybe not everyone comes downtown if you're not familiar. Um, you know, but at different times of the day, the roads are a little clearer, so people have the propensity to speed because there's not as many obstacles, right? And, and we know that psychologically folks kind of do that. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about um, how do folks advocate for, you know, when we saw this during the pandemic, especially when the roads certainly were very clear that the speed limit has gone up, it's been a kind of a continuous issue. We've heard about, you know, whether it's drag racing or just people going through high speeds or cutting through neighborhoods when you're going from one major. I mean, again, I think about, I always try to think about personally how things kind of affect me to put myself in the same shoes that residents are in because I'm a resident as well mm -hmm. you know living between two major streets and people doing cut throughs through neighborhoods and especially neighborhoods that don't have sidewalks or that have higher populations of young children how do folks advocate with CPD to help to enforce some of those uh, speed limits in those areas there's several ways obviously mm -hmm. uh, you know you've discussed a lot tonight about being involved in your community groups mm -hmm. So just starting there, uh, our community liaisons are out there all the time at different community meetings, and if you're, they're made aware of it. But I'll break it down into a couple different ways. One's gonna be, uh, if it's happening right now, and it's, it's the, the danger is right now, mm -hmm. you need to call our you know, non-emergency line right away at 645-4545, so mm -hmm. then that way an officer can be dispatched out there to take care of the issue that's right now. If it's kind of like your big picture problem, you know, like your, your longer term problem, it's happening all the time. Uh, that's where, uh, just like the director of public service said, uh, we utilize 311. 311 helps us track these uh, so that we can prioritize where we're putting resources and things like that. It's, it's an incredible, uh, you know, place to, to store data mm -hmm. and then us be able to u utilize that data to, to best put our resources where they're needed. So again, if it's something that's an emergency, it's happening right now, call our radio room. And that way an officer can be dispatched right now because that's gonna stop that immediate problem. And then there are community liaisons as mm -hmm. well. So folks can always go through their yeah. area commissions, which area commissions, as as I know all too well, will go <laughs> certainly advocate really uh, for these some of these traffic concerns and have talked to folks about, you know, with their community liaisons. I know some of them will come to community meetings in the neighborhoods as well. Yeah, and I think when they have downtime, they actually will go out and they'll enforce, you know, it, they'll, uh. they'll work on the problems that are brought to their attention. They'll, they'll make the bureaus aware that need to be aware of the problem, mm -hmm. but those officers as well, when they have you know, time away from different meetings and things like that, they go out and do, take actions, you know, that are gonna help their 
their community. No, thank you for that. And and also highlighting 311 because I'm not sure that people associate necessarily 311. I think they think of it for other departments within the city, but but not the police all the time. And so I think that giving that, uh, using that as another data point for collection of especially for some of the traffic concerns to get some of the enforcement because we certainly have heard, and if there's anything that you can share with public around just general traffic enforcement. I think I'm sure you you all have heard lots of feedback of how people are feeling around the enforcement. Can you share with folks where where some of the challenges have been with CPD or what are some of the things that maybe uh, practices that we're changing to address some of the enforcement issues? I'm sorry, I missed the first part of the question. Well, just around just traffic. I think just generally, I think there has been um, folks have heard, we've heard from residents that they've had, um, they don't feel like maybe CPD has, has addressed all of the enforcement issues as it pertains to traffic. I'm just wondering if there's like a particular change in practice or some challenges with staffing or other things that CPD is currently facing that may give that perception to the, to the public. Well, obviously, we're always dedicated to uh, enforcing traffic laws when, when we have the availability mm -hmm. to, you know, because, again, we can help lessen traffic accidents that are going to be either severe or deadly. Um, so when officers have time, uh, basically between dispatched runs and mm -hmm. violent crime and different things like that, uh, their priority is to enforce traffic laws and everything. So there's no change in policies or anything like that. Um, just like everywhere, we do face different challenges that come before us. Uh, but at the same time, our officers are very dedicated to enforcing traffic laws when they when they have the availability to. Thank you. Thank Absolutely. you for being here Absolutely. this evening. Um, and thank you for your testimony. Thank you. um, next up, we have Deputy CEO Monica Teles. Uh -huh. See, I needed to put the emphasis on there. Fowler from CODA. And then uh, William Murdoch from Morsi. Chair Bar Barroso de Bahia, uh, good evening and thank you for having this uh, public discussion. I'm Monica Tejas Fowler and I'm the Deputy CEO at the Central Ohio Transit Authority. On behalf of CODA, I'm here in support of the Vision Zero Action Plan. CODA has been proud to be a partner in the Vision Zero Columbus Initiative and our President and CEO, Joanna Pinkerton, serves on the Executive Committee. As the region's mobility solutions provider, which provides more than 30,000 passenger trips per day, the Vision Zero mission is eliminate, of eliminating traffic deaths is extremely important to our organization. The first page of this plan states that we commit to saving lives above all else on our city transportation system, and CODA affirms this commitment. We're here this evening not just to endorse this action plan, but as participants in it. CODA is committed to updating safety equipment on all our fixed route service transit vehicles, including improved blindside monitoring to alert transit vehicle operators to pedestrians, bicyclists, and other vehicles in their blind spots, and updating camera systems to provide improved visibility and real-time connectivity for live views of the activity taking place around the transit vehicle. CODA is also commi a committed partner in the Link Us initiative, which would establish mobility corridors on which transit vehicles will interact more safely with bikes, people, and other motor vehicles. Additionally, Link Us will create a better mobility environment for our residents and visitors through improved transit connections, better streets and roads, more sidewalks and crosswalks, as well as walking paths and bikeways. CODA also provides world-class training for new operators and refresher courses to our experienced professionals to ensure that they have the skills to deliver a safe service to thousands of customers every day. Our vehicle maintenance and facility maintenance teams work around the clock so that transit vehicles are running safely on our streets and our transit stops are positioned in locations where customers need them most. We thank our hardworking frontline employees for their continued dedication to our community. We are, already, we are already seeing a new mindset in Central Ohio when it comes to traffic safety. 
This community has embraced the Vision Zero mission. Now is the time to further put our commitment into action so that our streets are safe for everyone. Coda believes in the goal of zero traffic deaths and is excited to be a part, uh, to do our part to bring this to fruition. Thank you. Thank you for being here this evening. And um, I just all uh, wanna uplift, we talked a little bit before about bus rapid transit and we talked about uh, link us as another effort to move people efficiently and safely throughout the city. Coda is a key partner in that because you are the bus part of bus rapid transit. <laughs> um, and so I uh, would love to hear just a little bit around um, uh, you talked about CODA's commitment to safety and thinking about how we are moving people effectively and efficiently. Can you just talk a little bit about um, CODA's, how are we preparing for Link Us? Just because I think that this is a key part of how we talk about um, these things do not live in, in different silos, right? They go together. This is an overall strategy for keeping people safe and moving folks. So can you just talk a little bit about CODA and how we're preparing for Link Us, especially as we, you know, um, CODA, like many folks, have had some challenges with staffing, with some other things. What are, how are we preparing? How are we gearing up? And then also how can, um, how can folks get involved, right? What are the opportunities that might be available at CODA for our residents? Sure, um, and, and I'll, if you'll allow me, um, I'll answer as best I can, but I have Kelsey here to help me should I uh, fail to cover something. Um, I think that CODA has begun the process of uh, preparing themselves through uh, for the Link Us initiative in many different ways. Um, they are in regular conversation with the partners for Link Us, um, obviously, um, and so some of those conversations is, um, it's it goes, um, into the kind of the weeds a little bit where we're discussing what does that mean for everything. It's not just um, what does it mean on the roads or what does it mean for buses. It's um, what does it mean for the technology? What does it mean for um, safety improvements? What does it mean uh, for staffing level changes? Um, so internally at CODA, obviously, yes, we, we have had some uh, labor shortages on our operator side, but that has been something that we've been working very hard towards. I'm sure you've heard about our hiring event where we were um, had saw some um, great success there. Um, there are certainly discussions internally to continue those efforts. Uh, that's not our only, that's not our single point for, for filling those gaps. Um, as well as um, staffing our level, uh, staffing different divisions at levels that um, we can uh, scale according to the Link Us initiative um, as needed. So, and then some of the technology, um, you know, we're already having early discussions. You know, what what do we need two three years out? And so, building that long term capital plan is something that is a continuous conversation within Coda. Uh, but there is certainly an e even more in depth conversation with regard to uh, Link Us. So, um, do you want to add anything? Sure. If I can, if I can just add a little contextual information, I we're both steeped in Link Us all day, every day, as are many people in this room. But for those who don't know what it is, um, the core first thought to think to yourself is: as we prepare to add millions more people to this region, you can't just keep building new lanes on our local streets. People can try to do it on highways with mixed results, but we have to think differently about how we move around. No longer will our strongest strategy be to, to drive single occupancy vehicles around. We need to drive and, and join our community members in larger vehicles that will move fast. That's bus rapid transit and Link Us is a plan with several core partners Morpsey, whom you'll hear from, Franklin County um, Council President yourself, and, and Mayor Ginther, um, I think I said Franklin County, Columbus Partnership as well, um, to create five rapid transit corridors. And um, ultimately that would appear before the public as a question around raising additional public funds to do that um, in 2024. So as we think about what makes that successful it's also about what isn't happening on the vehicle, what's not happening on the bus. We call that transit supportive infrastructure. And that was so much of what um, uh, Director Gallagher spoke of today and what you spoke of, is what makes it 
um, what makes our system usable, um, what amenities draw people to participate in moving around with lots of their neighbors in a safe way. That's um, sidewalks and greenway access and protected bike lanes, even more clearly defined bike lanes, all that comes together but it's all undergirded, undergirded by strong partnerships with people who own the roads and the right of way. And in, for, for CODA, our service area encompasses the county, slivers of other counties, um, Dublin, Westerville, Grove City, Hilliard, um, and we need all of them to be bought into this vision. And there's some really great conversations happening right now where we're hearing what is their vision for rapid transit in their community. So I would just emphasize the partnership part of, of getting Link Us done. Thanks. Well, and I appreciate that. And I think um, one last thing I want to highlight is um, I think that uh, we, while CODA is its own entity, it is an entity, this is a uh, relation, this is a partner, a true partnership with the city that we need each other to be successful, right? And so as we think about um, Link Us and the future of what bus rapid transit and how we move people in the city of Columbus, and I know that folks will look and say, we want light rail or we want a train or we, uh, this is an opportunity to move people in a very different way. It's not a regular bus, it is not a regular, it is not the same experience. It is very much an experience of almost riding a train, right? It is moving without obstacles. And I think that uh, the investments that we are going to make together in this partnership to, to do that and to do all of the things that we were talking about this evening is key, I think, for our residents to really understand. Um, so I think it's not just about thinking about the place where we are, but where we want to go. And that's what we're building towards together. And so I think it's important that as we talk about both Vision Zero and Link Us, again, all of these strategies are bigger, long-term strategies. It's gonna take us a while to get to where we are, but it's about thinking much bigger than where the Columbus of today, but the Columbus of tomorrow. And that's what we're all really working towards. So I just wanna, again, thank you for being here this evening and thank you for um, helping to move our folks and thank you for being our family's second car. <laughs> Let's see y'all. Uh, now I'd like to welcome uh, the executive director of the, we've said MORPHC, everyone may not understand what that means. That is the Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, uh, William Murdoch, uh, to the podium. Well, good evening, uh, everyone, and Council Member Barosa Depadia, and members of the audience and partners. Thank you for the opportunity to speak and testify this evening on the city's 2023-2028 Vision Zero Columbus Action Plan. <clears throat> I'm a somewhat hoarse William Murdoch, <laughs> Executive Director of the Mid Ohio Regional Planning Commission. Our friends just call us Morpsy, as well as a member of the Vision Zero Columbus Executive Steer uh, Executive Advisory Committee, and also a Columbus resident. So. This impacts me as I leave my home walking, driving, or biking every day. Now, as you know, Morpsey is a partner with Columbus and the Regional Planning Council for more than 80 local governments in central Ohio. We work in 15 counties and provide a variety of programs in transportation, sustainability, data, land use, economic, and community development. We've been a Vision Zero Columbus partner since the start in 2020 and we're honored and grateful to serve alongside you in developing Vision Zero efforts in Columbus and beyond, both on the executive committee, but also with extensive staff involvement in the various steering committees that developed the initial action plan. Now, you know, uh, council member, at Morpsey, transportation safety is one of our core areas of focus. Unfortunately, it needs to be even more. In central Ohio, we've experienced a significant increase in traffic fatalities in recent years. As you heard Director Gallagher discuss, this is an urgent crisis. Last year, we released our Central Ohio State of Safety Report, which documents crash trends across our region. Between 2017 and 2021, 653 people were killed in traffic crashes. These fatal crashes have increased 33% over those five years, and 2021 was the deadliest year ever recorded with 153 lives lost. During that same five-year period, 
over 50,000 reported injury crashes occurred. 50,000, and that rate was up by over 30%. This is not population growth. This is a serious problem that is outstripping the rate of growth. It's urgent and it requires bold and clear and urgent steps. And we applaud the city for its leadership, you for your leadership, and especially Director Gallagher and her team for uh, advancing this so quickly and having the impact that they reported earlier. Now many of these deaths and serious injuries that occurred were within the city of Columbus, especially those involving pedestrians and other vulnerable road users and that's why we so strongly support the city's effort for assertively addressing this alarming trend with pedestrians and vulnerable road users and committing to the Vision Zero Action Plan. And we continue to offer whatever resources we can to this effort. As we've talked about with other speakers this evening, we're committed to link us. As part of the Vision Zero strategy, we are releasing an annual state of safety report where uh, we have a regional transportation safety forum every year. We're funding projects, we're bringing our staff expertise, uh, we're advocating, as you know, as a member of our regional policy committee, uh, laws to increase uh, penalties for distracted driving and uh, doing more as we can support this. So as we've talked about, ending traffic fatalities in Central Ohio is going to require a holistic approach. And we've already seen some progress in the city, some really tremendous progress reported earlier, and also around the region with things like traffic calming street design roundabouts, speed limit reductions, and distracted driving laws, and that work needs to continue. And as you know, we've talked about growth. We're primed for significant growth in Central Ohio. By our own estimates at Morphsey, the 15-county region will reach nearly 3.15 million residents in the next 25 years. This is a significant increase. And in many areas, this will also mean more density, more traffic, more people, and unfortunately, all of this could also lead to more crashes. At Morpsey, we're stressing a region-wide integrated approach to this growth, incorporating Vision Zero principles into our work, planning transportation infrastructure that residents will have access to a variety of safe and efficient transportation options, like Linkus and transit supportive infrastructure, and more. We face a great opportunity in the coming years to shape our streets for a generation. And it's imperative to ensure that these are built with safety, and equity in mind. And uh, we are just so appreciative of this effort. Uh, Council member, uh, you said it uh, earlier, I wrote it down, moving without obstacles. Well, part of moving without obstacles is keeping people safe, whether they're eight years old or 80 years old or in between. And this work is important. So we fully support your efforts to make our streets safe for all. And we're especially committed to the proposed Vision Zero Columbus Action Plan for 23 to 28. Appreciate the chance to give testimony and happy to offer any assistance or take any questions. Um, can you talk a little bit, just for folks who may not understand the role of Morphsey or what Morphsey does, how we work within the region to both connect communities, but also these policy, we have policy planks that we put forward as a public policy uh, roundtable. How do we, what, what does that, mean how does that work and what is the significance of that just so that folks as they're watching or play this back they really understand the role that Morphsey plays. Thank you for the, mm -hmm. the question. So Morphsey is the regional council for Central Ohio. What that means is we work with 85 local governments. Columbus of course is our largest uh, throughout the region to help them coordinate on transportation projects. So part of our role is we work with the federal and state government to help communities prioritize how to spend transportation dollars. This involves uh, committees informed by data and looking at everything from trends to technology to vulnerable road users and equity to make sure that as communities are deciding how to spend individual resources, but also as a region, where they want to invest. And part of that work has especially in recent years turned towards safety. So that's a very important part of our role. Uh, we're close partners uh, with the city of Columbus on all things Department of Public Service is uh, engaged, uh, I think, just about every day talking about how we can better improve our transportation system as well as other partners like CODA as well. Uh, when it comes to policy, Morpsey plays a special role in convening local governments of all kinds to help advance better policy at the state level and the federal level to help our local governments, our communities tackle safety, tackle important issues. Uh, as a vice chair of our committee, we appreciate your leadership, but 
some of the things that we focused on are transportation. We're focused on sustainability and climate. We're also focused on racial equity and justice. And we're focused on advancing data and advancing the role of those things in the community. And one of the most important relevant ones for safety is we've been very vocal advocates for distracted driving uh, laws because we know how dangerous it's been. And we've done so through that lens of equity. And the recent state uh, legislation has been something that's been very powerful, but we know that our work isn't done. I think earlier it was mentioned it's a complicated law, but it's also one that could be improved uh, not through just simplification and enforcement, but also through that lens of racial equity. So these are things that, as a regional council, we're that, that resource for Central Ohio, that place where uh, local governments come together to plan and to advocate for better communities. Thank you. And the last question that I have, uh, we are working to connect, right, the region. Yes. And we're doing that through multi-modes of, I mean, when we think about our waterways, when we think about our trails, et cetera, can you just give a quick little snippet of what that looks like? Because again, as I think we've been talking about connectivity and transportation and how people move, and I think that's a key part that we are starting to really dig into and would love for um, folks to hear, hear about that as well. Council member, I appreciate the question, and, and you know I love to talk about this, so I'll try <laughs> to keep it short. We need, to, uh, as a region, we're thinking about transportation and how it all connects together. It's been mentioned here earlier, it's not just about driving cars. That's an important part of the system, but part of the system is giving people options whether they want options or whether they need it. And what that means is looking for ways to improve transit options, whether it's things like passenger rail, or bus rapid transit, or better, more connected forms of transit, both in the urban areas and around. It means better bike infrastructure, both along our trails and greenways, and we've been working with the community to take what is, five, uh, to take what is 200 miles of existing trails and blossom that to a 500-mile regional network through initiatives like Rapid 5 or Central Ohio Greenways. We're also focused on how all of these things connect neighborhoods with sidewalks, bike trails, transit, better access, so that communities of all uh, kinds around our region have access to nature, have access to shopping, have access to jobs. This is really an important comprehensive approach for us. Um, the region as it's growing is growing uh, better connected and that transportation system really should give those options. It really should be something that we're proud of that uh, uh, really is something that Frankly, in Central Ohio, we want folks to brag about the transportation options and how easy it is to get around, whether or not you own a car. So that's something we're focused on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you for your advocacy, and thank you for all the good work that um, Morsi does. I appreciate your leadership and appreciate you being here this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we are going to move to public testimony, and we have, uh, we received four pieces of written testimony. We're also going to share that with public service, just so folks can see. There were some very specific points in there that folks um, uh, shared everything from uh, thinking about how they move in the city to uh, specific neighborhood concerns. Um, we're also going to share some feedback that we got uh, from with our partners at CODA um, from some of our residents. Um, but I want to invite up Kyle Campbell. Kyle, is Kyle here? Did we lose Kyle? Yes, looks like Kyle is not here. Okay, so um, with that we will, uh, so we have no Jessica, then we're good. Great. So um, I want to thank folks for a really robust discussion this evening. I want to thank all of our partners who were here. I want to thank the residents who took the time to write in um, public testimony on Vision Zero specifically. I want, uh, I also, I think this goes without saying, again, I, I am hard pressed to ever go to an area commission meeting, meet with a resident where I don't care about their concerns about sidewalks or uh, thinking about transportation or roadways or something else. So even if their presence is not here, all of that feedback is certainly something that our office connects with. We meet with public service on a weekly basis to not just talk about legislation, but also policy and how we work together to, um, to improve our roadways, to improve safety for our residents. Um, I wanna thank, again, the Department of Public Service uh, for taking up Vision Zero and for moving this. This happened way 
before I came into office, certainly, but has definitely been something that, again, I started with something that I'm personally very passionate about and um, ensuring that when I think about the various numbers that we heard this evening from the folks who have um, the lives who have who we lost here in the city, the lives that we lost around the region um, senselessly because uh, we removed accidents from our vocabulary and are continuing to do that because there are no accidents. It's someone did something that they should not have done. We were distracted. We didn't follow the rules of the road. Something happened that, um, unfortunately, there are families today that are mourning the loss of a loved one. There's someone who is living with chronic pain or doesn't have the mobility that they once had because we are not following the rules of the road or, or um, uh, we're not doing the things that we should be doing to be good neighbors and good humans to each other. And so at the end of the day, when we think about Vision Zero, it is deeply rooted in our people and ensuring that our people are safe. And that is something that I think that all of us can agree on. Whether we think about the strategies and we have disagreements of whether it, what, whether we like bump outs or, or speed bumps or whatever it may be, I think that we can all agree we want our kids, um, our families, our neighbors to be safe. And so that's really what this effort is about. And so after hearing the testimony of this evening, after taking into account um, the uh, thoughtfulness of the plan that was put, be, put forward for the next five years, um, we plan to introduce Ordinance 1652-2023 this Monday at uh, our City Council meeting on June 12th to adopt the Vision Zero Columbus Action Plan 2.0. If residents have further after hearing uh, our testimony this evening, after seeing this, have further questions or want to provide more input, um, please reach out to my office. You can read it, reach out to my aide, Amaris Lemus at A-S-L-E-M-U-S -S at columbus.gov. You can also look, you can Google that on our website. Those are lots of letters. Um, but again, thank you for everyone who came this evening. Thank you for all of our advocates in our neighborhoods, in our communities, and our residents who advocate on these issues every single day. And with that, I wish everyone a good night and be safe on our roadways. Thank you.